When we last left, Infocom had just gotten its first bit of seriously bad financial news. If you haven't heard the first part of this interview, I strongly recommend listening to it before jumping in here. And if you have already, well then, let's find out what's going to happen next. Now, at this point, Infocom is still a privately held company, correct? Yes, it always well until it was sold to Activision, it always was. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, so you have this massive prod, uh, a project. Now, Cornerstone is a, da a database software, correct? Yes. Okay. And the idea, the idea behind it was to make something that uh, a fairly, uh, not a, that you could create a database without being a programmer. Now, that didn't mean you were not, you know, facile with computers and didn't have, you know, some sense for logic and whatever. I mean, it wasn't that anybody could, could use it, but it meant that someone uh, could create their own database without having to call in the IT people, which was an issue with a lot of companies. Uh, if you were trying to use something like DBase, you pretty much had to have someone program it for you. And the idea with Cornerstone was to make it something that was you know, that a, a smart person could design their own database. And it got fantastic reviews. And it was uh, relatively successful considering that that year was such a terrible year. But it didn't sell as much as was projected and we didn't raise money. So we got into a really serious financial hole that year. Gotcha. And yeah, uh, sorry. I'm imagining now the the idea that okay, so you have this product, it gets good reviews. It's just really, really poor timing. Um, what does management do? Do they double down on Cornerstone, or do they say, okay, we have to really start pumping out more games? Uh, neither, in a way. I mean. Uh... I mean, Cornerstone, we didn't cut back on the Cornerstone team or the game team as we ran into financial difficulty. The uh, expectation, I think, the hope was still to pull off, you know, a miracle and raise money. Uh, there was also then discussion about trying to sell one or the other or both. So backing up a little, we had had offers to buy the company. Um, we had... A, um, so Douglas Adams, when he first uh, got in touch with us, when we first were introduced to him, which would have been, I mean, Hitchhikers came out in uh, September, October 84, right? Yes. And he, he got in touch with us sort of, Spring, summer, 83. I mean, I negotiated the contract with his agent. So I was already there as the contract was being put together in the summer of 83, summer, fall of 83. So um, the way Douglas got put in touch with us was his publisher, Simon & Schuster, was encouraging selling the rights to his books uh, for uh, various purposes, including games. And Douglas was already an Infocom fan. He had played Suspended as his first game. He loved it. We didn't yeah. know this. But um, he told Simon & Schuster, there's only one game company I'd even consider uh, working with, and that's Infocom. So then Simon and Schuster got in touch with us without telling us that Douglas had made this pronouncement and started dangling folks like Douglas in front of us, like, hey, we should do a deal or potentially buy you, and then you could do things like work with Douglas Adams. So we were starting discussions um, with Simon and Schuster about a potential acquisition. And... I know Joel went down and met with um, Dick Snyder, who was the CEO. I think Dick was still alive, as a matter of fact. He was this, I viewed him as you know an old guy, because I think he had gray or white hair at the time. He was probably around 50. 
And um, he uh, was kind of the the king of publishers. You know, he, he was very highly regarded throughout the publishing industry. I think Simon & Schuster was the largest publisher in the world at the time. And he had been the CEO and a high-level exec there for quite a long time already. So he was like, you know, God at Simon & Schuster. So Mark and I went down to meet with him at some point in the fall of 84. Uh, no, I must have been, could it have been 83? No, I'm pretty sure it was when Hitchhikers was coming out that, that he and I, uh, that he and I went down. So we, we got introduced to hit, to Douglas by Simon and Schuster. Douglas then got wind of the fact that they were using Douglas as a ploy to make a deal with us. And he got angry. He said, wait a second. I'm the one who told you about those guys. If we're going to do a deal with them, I'm going to do it directly with them, not through you. So he viewed it as Simon and Schuster was trying to, you know, I think take some of the, the deal for a game. And he wanted to be, you know, he wanted to do it direct. So he pushed them aside. We did the deal directly with him. The game was worked on over the following, you know, good chunk of a year. As the game was being launched in 84, we are talking to Dick Snyder. So Mark and I fly down to New York. He has us for lunch. And uh, it was a very, very impressive meeting. I remember it very, very well. It was in the Rockefeller Center, uh, 30 Rock. It was the building. It was the floor that was originally built for the Rockefeller Foundation. So if you think about the 1930s, you know, building Rockefeller Center, and the Rockefeller Foundation was by far the wealthiest foundation on the planet. You can kind of imagine how that floor might look. So we were in the boardroom for Simon & Schuster, which had been built as the boardroom for the Rockefeller Foundation. It was stunningly gorgeous. You know, you went to the bathroom and gold-plated never looked so tasteful. <laughs> you know, it was amazing. And this conference table was, you know, it felt like a mile long. I think you could put 20 people around it with their arms out and not touch each other. It was huge. And the three of us are at one end of it. So Mark and I, uh, uh, Dick Snyder at the very end and Mark and I next to him. And he has his private chef make us the best Dover sole I've ever had and his butler serve it to us. <laughs> Oh, this is impressive, right? And he's, you know, trying to sell us on the idea of being purchased by Simon and Schuster. And Mark is doing a lot of the talking. Mark is, you know, describing a lot of Infocom's history and how it came about and whatever. And at some point he says, Mike, you ought to tell him about Zork Users Group and Invisiclues and everything. And so I start telling him about, you know, that and Invisiclues. And Dick, Dick Snyder says, wait a second, you're charging how much for those books? And I said, well, $9.95. And he said, Okay, so that's really close to hardback pricing. Remember, this is, you know, adjusting for inflation, that would be more like $30 today. He said, and you've sold how many of them? And I said, about 400,000 so far. And he said, do you realize you're one of the best selling authors on the planet? <laughs> and I was <laughs> totally taken aback. No, it never even occurred to me. He said, you're not Stephen King, but you're, you're right up there. <laughs> and I, I was just dumbfounded, right? That was one of my, the best quotes of my entire career. <laughs> anyway, um, they then, after that, they sent a high level. So Simon and Schuster was part of Gulf and Western, which was a conglomerate that owned a whole bunch of companies. Uh, uh, um, Woody Allen in one of his films famously called them Engulf and Devour, which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> but, um, they sent a high level exec, flew up in a private jet. Um, came in a limousine to uh, Infocom headquarters. I mean, everyone there was impressed like, by this big limo that was sitting outside. And to meet with Al Veza to talk about buying the company. And this is, you know, late 84. They offered $28 million as their starting offer. And, uh, you know, again, addressing for inflation, that's, you know, like 90 million bucks today. And it was three times what we internally thought the company was worth. So it was like, you know, a significant premium. I would have taken it in a minute yeah. um, as a shareholder. And um, 
apparently Al was just sort of being very, you know, Al and very noncommittal and, you know, clearly he, he had this kind of weakness of, he kind of assumed anybody like that was pulling something on him, right? And that it must be worth more than that. And I just don't know. And I don't know why. And so he was being very cagey and difficult. And the guy got frustrated. He said, look, if it's just a matter of a few million dollars, just tell me. And Al, Al just, you know, wasn't, wasn't moving in any direction. And the guy just got frustrated and said, you're wasting my time. Got up and stormed out and got a new limo and flew back to New York. And that was the last we heard of it. So then we get into, you know, financial trouble the following year. And when we finally sold to Activision, which closed on Friday, the 13th of June, 1986, um, the shareholders got $2 million. So, yeah. Uh, that, that is a, uh, a bit of a loss yeah. in comparison. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So now the deal with Douglas Adams obviously still happened, independent of the Simon Schuster deal falling through. Um, well, and the deal with Douglas Adams happened well before, um, so the deal with Douglas Adams happened in 83. By the way, it was a six title deal. We had the right to do six, um, games based on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The first game was intended to be about half of the first book. And it, we had every right to do five more games with or without Douglas involved. I mean, we, by contract, if we just put out another game, and now, fairly shortly after finishing the prior one, we had the right to just continue. You might ask and why didn't we? <laughs> I, 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 you, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yes. Of course, as head of marketing, with Hitchhikers being a number one bestseller and the best-selling game we've done since Zork 1, I, of course, wanted to do more Hitchhikers games. Douglas was getting, we, we definitely loved working with Douglas. We liked him as a person. We liked spending time with him. Um, he was, you know, just brilliant and fun and interesting and the best dinner companion you could possibly have. Um, and he was getting sick to death with hitchhikers and he felt like he was being typecast essentially. You know, he was being locked into this little rut and that he would never get out of it. He kept doing hitchhiker after hitchhiker after hitchhiker. So this was when he was, um, you know, pitching Dirk gently, you know, to the publishers. But it was also when he um, was us saying, hey, I have other ideas, you know, that'll sell just as well. You know, let's put hitchhikers on hold and do something else. So. Um, we, we caved to keep him happy because we wanted, we wanted, we wanted him involved. We wanted him, you know, to be part of the design of any other hitchhikers game. And we also wanted his public relations help, uh, which was invaluable. I mean, we, we even got him on David Letterman. I mean, you know, it was very easy to book, uh, PR with Douglas. As a matter of fact, uh, the very first press conference we ever did was for Hitchhikers. And it was uh, September. It was like a month before the game came out. It was in New York City. It was uh, in Rockefeller Center, as a matter of fact. It was, it was the floor below the Rainbow Room, which is the restaurant at the top of one of those buildings. I think it was like the 64th floor. And we had like an L-shaped room at the corner that faced sort of southwest. And we invited uh, the, the PR folks said, do it at the end of the day, and then people will kind of do it as their last thing before going home, and you'll get you'll get more of them to show up, and you can serve drinks, and they won't care about drinking because that you know it's the last thing they're doing that day, whatever. So we invited you know the New York, the game press, but also I mean, we had the Wall Street Journal there, we had the New York Times there, we had you know all the top press. I mean, we're like. 95 or so press showed up. Um, wow. Douglas Adams. And I had to do a fair amount of the, and I not, I, even now I'm very nervous as a public speaker, but back then I was incredibly nervous as a public speaker. And I had to get up and talk about all the marketing 
and show off the package and all the materials and the, the you know the, the stuff that we were sending out to the dealers and you know everything we were doing and so i actually had the biggest chunk of the press conference and there were maybe 20 25 photographers there you know all with the old style flashes and they're all right in front of me you know kind of crouched down and every time i lifted anything up all these flashes were <laughs> driving me crazy and one after another i'm you know i'm talking about you know the individual pieces in the package you know the poster the this the that and at the very end i mentioned oh and by the way you know we're uh, bringing back hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy radio series on national public radio uh you know in a couple of months and all the press gasped and oohed and odd and i was like what's the big deal <laughs> you know that was way cheaper than most of the stuff I just held up. And <laughs> Douglas came up to me and said, I can't believe you did that. My, my book publishers never did that. That's brilliant. And I was thinking, you know, they're only charging us $6,000 to do this for the entire year on as many national uh, public radio stations around the country as want to carry it. And they can run it as wow. many times for 12 months. And we had something like 100 radio stations carry it. And literally, BBC charged six thousand dollars for that. Oh my God, that's 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 a gimme. I know. That's what I thought, and I was like, "What? You know, why are they so impressed?" <laughs> it's not, you know, compare uh, the poster cost more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys at least get some kind of promotion? You know, like on NPR, brought to you by or sponsored by? Yeah, well. You know, we, they were very, very careful at the time about not making it look like they were being commercial. Yeah. NPR, public radio in general at the time was very careful not to sound like they were in the pocket of any advertiser. They did not want, uh, any mention of the fact that, um, I don't think we could even say that we were the makers of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game. I wow. think we ended up compromising on was it brought to you by Infocom, makers of fine interactive fiction uh, games or something to that effect. I mean, we, we sort of got it in. And of course, we did a bunch of, you know, as much PR as we could about the fact that we were sponsoring it. And we got in touch with all the radio stations that picked it up and asked them, you know, would you like to do some sort of promotion where we give away free games? And of course, they all want to do things like that, right? So we were able to get kind of go around the national folks and get a lot of the radio stations to do stuff. Um, but it was um, very limited as to what we could say. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so now going back to the post Simon and Schuster uh, sale. Uh, I guess we're in 86, 87 territory. Uh, what does the Infocom market look like uh, at that point? Are the software sales, are the game sales still strong? Um, has there been any further development on Cornerstone, maybe a version 2.0? What is going on there? And uh, are you guys now looking at the rest of the market and is there any sign of worry on the horizon? Oh, there were all sorts of worries. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 285, we, we had to pretty drastically cut back on marketing, especially in, into the fall. Um, and, you know, cause we were running out of cash and, um, Spring 86, we were spending almost nothing. We laid off the entire Cornerstone team, uh, sort of late 85, early 86. I mean, okay. I think we kept them on. I think, I, I, I'm pretty sure Brian Berkowitz was kept around for, you know, two or three extra months. He had written most of the code. He was brilliant beyond belief. Um, he, he ended up uh, just as an aside, working uh, next for Microsoft. So he, um, wow. early 86, he interviewed at Microsoft. He got an offer, got an offer of a fair number of stock options. And um, 
he was going to be working directly for Bill Gates as one of the software architects. And Bill had the architects for each of the major systems that they were working on all report directly to him. The architects didn't have to have reports. So they didn't have to manage programmers. They didn't have to, you know, deal with all the, uh, they could just be brilliant, um, idea guys and they had complete control over what the product was actually going to look like. Oh, so wow. they, they hired him in that role and gave him a pretty big hefty bunch of stock options. I remember him telling me the number and then they went public before he started. So oh. instead of getting his up at a dollar a share, like they had originally talked, they now, because it was public, they had to do it at the, at the new market public price, which was $32 a share. And I remember he was pissed as hell that he got all these options now at, you know, the strike price was way up and they were never going to be worth that. <laughs> yeah. He was just like, so <laughs> you know, he was generally a, kind of a pessimist. He was kind of funny. It'll, you know, it, it'll never work. And if it works, it'll never sell. That's kind of a, a Brian Berkowitz, you know. <laughs> so um he um by the way by like around 2000 the peak of the dot com uh era i remember calculating what that original stock option grant was worth and uh he had gotten many more grants after that i'm sure uh, that original grant was worth half a billion dollars oh jesus and you know he had three three you know, he had a mansion in Seattle. He had a major property uh, down in Oregon, another major property on the Snake River in Idaho. He, you know, he he did very very well <laughs> working for Microsoft. <laughs> and you know, he, so he was in charge of access. He was in charge of the file system for Windows. Eventually, he was in charge of security and encryption. He was a you know real high level guy there. Unfortunately, he died very young uh, of some. Very unusual disease. I don't remember what it was. Anyway, that was a long aside. I didn't mean to go there. Um, no problem. No problem. So, yeah, early, late 85, early 86, we had drastically cut back on um, investment and particularly in marketing. I don't recall us laying off any of the game team. It's possible we let some folks go by attrition. I can't remember. But, um, we were trying to sell the game company and we had interest and Activision, I believe Joel met with Jim Levy, who was the co-founder and CEO of Activision around Christmas time of 85 and got, you know, an initial level of interest. And so over the following, you know, five months or so, we went through the whole due diligence process and, you know, you know, getting down to an actual merger and that takes time. So we were just kind of barely hanging on through that. Uh, and so all that time we lost a lot of the momentum and we were looking to Activision to, you know, really insert a fair amount of, you know, new capital and new energy into the company. And, um, kind of let us recover but um well activision had a fair amount of cash at the time they bought us they you know they had made a lot of money in the uh cartridge uh the atari cartridge uh era so they they made a profit in like the 83 time frame and they had gone public and raised a ton of money. And then over the following two or three years, they had been, that money pile had been dwindling. But they still had a fair amount when they bought us. And the reason they bought us was they decided the future was in the, you know, the PC realm and that buying a company like Infocom gave them, you know, a foothold there and also a lot of credibility there. I mean, much of the industry was shocked that we sold to Activision because we were still viewed as like a triple A company and they were viewed as more like a B or a C company. Um, and obviously we, you know, we had 
come so close to going bankrupt that we really weren't internal a triple A company anymore because mm. we hadn't uh, uh, invested in the future the way we needed to. So we were expecting to be delivered by Activision. And initially we, things went fairly well. I mean, we, Jim Levy loved us. We had a famous, uh, Friday um, gathering um, when Jim came out to visit. And I think that, I can't remember for certain, but I think that might have been the day that the, the, the sale closed. And, um, you know, he came, he was going to speak at the company meeting. And one of the things that was fa- we were famous for was uh, various hacks at company meetings. We often, um, well, for instance, Steve Moretzky went on a date with Betty Rock and, you know, word got out and Betty Rock worked in sales, uh, telesales, and Steve was one of our, you know, top designers. They went on a date and the next Friday, to their surprise, we held a wedding. <laughs> I still have, I still have the matchbook that says, you know, Moretzky Rock and, and the date. And, you know, they went all out, you know, with a carpet down the aisle and everything to, to marry the two of them as a joke because they'd gone out once, right? Mm-hmm. Well, as it turned out, you know, they, they continued going out and they did get married and they're still married. <laughs> so, um, anyway, the, um, Jim Levy meeting to his surprise and to Joel's surprise, um, a wedding was, uh, planned. And so as Jim got up to talk to the company meeting, um, some of the key people like Stu Galley and Steve Moretzky, whatever said, uh, uh, Jim, uh, come with us. And they pulled him out of the room and the rest of us are sitting there like, what the hell is going on? Well, they roll a carpet down the aisle. They do the, the Jewish, um, what is the, the cloth that's held over the, the couple called? Oh. The, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know the name. So, you know, they have one of those. Uh, Stu Galley comes out dressed as a rabbi, Rabbi Gallowitz. And um, Joel is brought up front to be the groom. And then they start playing the wedding march. And Jim Levy in the back is wearing a bridal veil and carrying a huge bouquet of flowers. And he walks up the aisle and he pulls it off. Perfectly. He looked like the blushing bride, so happy, tears <laughs> in his eyes to walk up the aisle. And then uh, Stu Galley did a marriage ceremony, which included reciting the Hacker's Oath from Hacker, the book Hackers. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, I believe it, like, that book was already out, and I'm pretty sure that's what they did. Anyway, um, you know, they stepped on the, you know, the glass and everything. They had the whole. And and Jim could not have pulled it off better. So he was one of us. I mean, we viewed him as uh, an Infocom guy, and he had a sense of humor. He appreciated, you know, our our weird sense of humor, and he was an ally. The problem was, well, you didn't we didn't realize this. Um, he was uh, losing support with his board, and uh, there was a. Uh, sort of a palace coup. So Bruce Davis had been hired by the board as sort of a consultant to take a look at the company and what was happening and and what was going wrong. And um, apparently he was totally opposed to them buying Infocom. He wanted to buy Sierra online. Um, Sierra, they he had made an offer for Sierra and he told me it was in the $2 million range. And uh, Ken Williams had, and Roberta had pushed back and they wanted to take it up to like 2.1 or 2.2. And he viewed that as a no brainer, but the board wouldn't support him increasing the bid. They thought that he could still get it for the two and it ended up falling through. Wow. Well, it ended up costing them eight because even though the shareholders only got two, there was six million in debt that had to be paid. Um, Ooh, okay. All- accounts payable, we owed money to the bank, we owed money to the landlord, we owed money to everybody. And um, so he viewed them as make, making a mistake. They should have bought Sierra Online, they bought Infocom instead for way more money. And so from day one, he was hostile. He ended up 
reporting to the board that the problem was Jim Levy and his crew and that they should make him CEO. And they did. And they fired Jim and they fired his entire executive team. And Bruce Davis took over. And Bruce was not a fan of Infocom. And we knew it. <laughs> and, and, you know, his, one of the things he did fairly, fairly quickly after taking over was he had the, he was not from the games industry. He was a lawyer. No offense. <laughs> but none he, taken, none taken. He didn't really, from our point of view, understand like what made a successful game studio and started making changes that we felt were, you know, a big mistake. Well, one of them was the way we had always viewed our games was sort of the book industry model, which was you put a bunch of things out and a few of them become your stalwarts, your, your, your ever selling, you know, backlist. And you make a lot of your money off the backlist. And that's the money that you use to do all the experimental new stuff, hoping to add to your backlist. And so Infocom, you know, Zork 1 was still selling and still selling reasonably well, right? We had certain games that just kept selling and selling and selling. And we supported them. Bruce said, this is a hit driven industry and it's ridiculous to be wasting shelf space on this old stuff. We should clear it out of there and just make room for new stuff. And our response was, but half of our revenue and all of our profits come from that old stuff. And his, 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 he also said, you need to dramatically increase the number of games you're putting out. We were doing like four to five a year. He wanted us to take it up to more like eight. And we said, well, the trend in the industry is to spend more on each game and put more effort into each game. So our competition is you're ramping up with more and more development spending. And you're asking us to do the opposite. We really probably should be investing more in each new title and maybe not doing as many. And, you know, he vetoed that, you know, no, you know, you, you got to ramp up. So we're cutting back on effort per game and, and dollars spent on launching a game and the amount put into the packaging and the amount on advertising and you name it and stretching our resources thinner and thinner. So from my point of view, the writing was on the wall from that point that this was a, a losing strategy that we were only, you know, as a matter of luck, if we just happened to have, you know, to, to luck upon a, you know, a hit product, would we possibly be able to, to survive this? Gotcha. Now, uh, while this is happening and there, uh, and Activision is pushing for more product, is there also any push from Activision to update the technology that Infocom was using? Not that I recall. I mean, it's possible there was some discussion about that, but uh, that, I don't think that was the focus. Okay. There was, and There was... Um, one of the things that we were pushed to do, um, and, you know, we did it, but, you know, we... Well, okay. Tom Snyder Productions was a Boston area company that had pitched Activision on something they were working on, which was a uh, fairly uh, simple graphics um, that could be done fairly, fairly inexpensively, kind of a comic book level of graphics. And, um, they were impressed with with the demo, and because they were a Boston area company, and because they they were pushing us to go off in new directions, uh, they suggested that we take that on. So that became Info Comics, um, and um, the guy who who created the technology for Tom Snyder Productions, uh, Omar Kadari. Uh, we ended up hiring him. He left Tom Snyder as we were working on it, or maybe even before we signed the contract to work on it. 
And so we ended up becoming his very first consulting gig. He went on to later found a company, um, I'm going to bonk on the name, but they did a very successful racing series of racing games. And he, he did very well there. He, just as another aside, ended up being uh, on the harmonics board in the very early days. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So Omar developed this technology at Tom Snyder, split off. Um, we worked with him to um, kind of take the technology to the next level and create the Infocomics uh, line of products. And so they were done as a, you know, sort of quick and dirty, um, low priced. So we charge, you know, the retail price was 12 bucks as opposed to, you know, 40 or $50 for our typical game. Um, and the hope was that, you know, they would sell in very large quantities as sort of an impulse buy at the cash register in stores. Um, that didn't end up happening. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask about the info comics. I had not heard of them when they originally came out, but I remember this must have been around 95 in a small mom and pop shop. I was going through a, a bin of old C64 software that they had there. And I found uh, two of the info comics and picked them up, I think for a buck each or something. And uh, I do remember reading them and I was thinking about what we talked about with the uh, universal graphics. Um, was that also something that was implemented there where the, the vector based graphics that were in, in these info comics were the same across all the platforms? If I recall correctly, they were, but I'm pretty vague on that. I have to admit. Oh, okay. Um, and you basically already said that they did not sell all that well. Um, no, <laughs> they did not. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the reviews sort of panned them too, as I recall. Well, they weren't really games. They were just sort of you, you, you could change the perspective of the story from at different points, but it was just an, a, a linear story that you were following. Yeah. It was kind of like a choose your own adventure book, you know, you know, hmm decision at this point and you want to go this way or that way so um, yeah and uh, now in addition to that the same year you got um, a, a strategy game came out under the infocom label that was the uh, i believe uh it was a battle tech uh based yeah. game so we did a deal with interactive to do battle tech and so that that too was a way for us to try to get, you know, out of our, you know, call it a rut if you want, right? you know, but out of just doing interactive fiction and trying to expand the Infocom brand. And, you know, you had earlier on, we had companies coming to us in our heyday, begging us to publish their games. And probably stupidly, we viewed that as a distraction. It's not something that was our strategy. We felt that interactive fiction was, you know, only, only scra what scratched the surface so far. It was, you know, much, much bigger than what we've done with it to date. And, you know, we needed to concentrate our efforts on, on, uh, expanding interactive fiction. So we turned down games that became bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> who had begged us to uh, to publish them. I'm trying to think of that there's one in particular uh, maybe a little, uh, if I ask Steve Moretzky, he'll probably remember. Uh, he, he's my memory for some of these things. But, um, uh, you know, they came to us. They had multiple meetings with us. We were very impressed with the game. We loved the game. But we said, no, no, that's really just not us. We're not a publisher of other people's products. And of course, you know, the companies that ended up succeeding, you know, folks like Electronic Arts became publishers of other people's products. And, you know, they were really a marketing and distribution organization primarily. I mean, they do also do development, but it's not, you know, it, 
for many, many years, it was not their primary business. And yeah. had, had we gone down that route, I think we could have been successful. It would have been a big change in the, in the company in many ways. I mean, we had to beef up sales and marketing dramatically. Um, but it probably would have made money and it probably would have kept us in business. Um, <laughs> who knows for sure. Okay. And it, was that a deal that was initiated inside of Infocom or was that something that Activision initiated? I would have to go back and dig through files or talk to some other folks. I think, I think, I think it was a combination. I think it was something that we were, uh, you know, perfectly willing to do. What I can't remember is whether the intro came through Activision or through us. But I think both sides were, uh, positive about doing it. As this keeps going, this I believe we're already in the mediagenic era of Activision, or had they not changed the name yet at this point? Well, that was, you know, I think within a year of Bruce taking over, he changed the name, so it was probably around 1988 time frame that it got changed. Hmm. Um, took over in eight, sometime in 87. Um, yeah, we all thought it was a horrendous name. Um, I think, <laughs> you know, it is a joke in the industry. Um, but, and they spent a fortune, you know, on all the work involved in making that change. I mean, you know, that, they didn't have a ton of money left and they were going through it at a reasonable clip and to spend, my guess is it was well over a million dollars to change your corporate identity. Yeah. I, you know, none of us at Infocom thought it would. I mean, we thought Activision was a way better brand name. <laughs> than <laughs> and, and obviously, when they went bankrupt and Bobby Kotick bought it out of bankruptcy, he changed it back to Activision immediately. <laughs> and, and, they've, and they've been okay since. <laughs> uh, just okay, yeah, yeah. They, they they're kind of making it uh, making ends meet. <laughs> Bobby is now a multi billionaire. Yeah, almost as if he had stock options in Microsoft at the beginning. <laughs> um, okay, now uh, there is a moment when Infocom, and this was always something that I wasn't quite sure of, Infocom does release a series of adventure games uh, in 89, 90 that do have graphics. Uh, there's a, a Journey, The Quest Begins, and Arthur, The Quest for Excalibur, and so forth. Now, were those internal developments or? Yeah, I mean, they were all internal. Yes. So, you know, we hired a group of artists. We decided that, you know, we had to take the plunge and, you know, add graphics to our adventure games. And that decision was, we was well underway, you know, by mid-88, and I, and I think the decision was made well before mid-88 to do that. Um, so we had, uh, Arthur was being done by Bob Bates, um, who had already done a couple of games with us, as I recall, as an outside contractor, but working with our engine. Um, and then we, so I mean, yeah, he was essentially an, an Infocom implementer, but he was, uh, contracted with independently and he you know uh, as I recall he would have had some upside in the sale of his games whereas our internal folks would not can't remember the exact uh, deal terms with him but he was working with our engine making games uh, for us and um, he after Infocom shut down started his own company Legend Entertainment he hired, he worked with Steve as a contractor and Steve did the spellcasting 101, 201, 301 series and superhero league of Hoboken. Yeah. Uh, for it's a legend. But anyway, um, we, I'm trying to think of all four games. Can you think of the other two? There was also a Zork that had, uh, graphics, right? Um, uh, let's see. Zork, uh, there was Zork Zero. Zork Zero. Zork Zero. Is that um, a, 
it's also I'm, I'm looking it up on Moby Games right now to see. Yes, yeah, Zork Zero had graph uh, had some limited graphics. It looks like, or at least yeah. some kind of uh, yeah, it had graphics depending on the. So there were four, so Steve Maretsky did Zork Zero. Um, then there was Quarter Staff. So Quarter Staff was done independently. That was done by. I don't think that was done internally, was it? Uh, no, here I have developed by simulated environment systems. Yeah, and um, a fa- the Fawcett game was done with um, Lewis Castle, his company in Las Vegas. Westwood, you know, Westwood West- Associates, which became a, you know a pretty significant studio over time, and then they got they got purchased by Electronic Arts. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, so we had that developed outside. We had Quarterstaff developed outside. But the four games that were text adventures with graphics were done with an engine we built internally. And 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 uh, except for the fact that Bill, Bob Bates was working outside, they were you know developed internally. The the art. Oh, Shogun was one of them too. Right? Shogun, yes. So. Yeah, we had a group of artists who uh, created all of that art for those games. Um, and we were trying to take the step into the, you know, the Sierra sort of uh, graphic adventure game uh, with, you know, with an Infocom twist. Gotcha. And how will the, how were those games received both critically and commercially? I don't the, commercially not not that well, um, but also this was at the point in time when you know Infocom was basically by the time they were released, Infocom was shut down, which was well known mm. <laughs> to uh, to the the fan base, I think, um, and, and to the you know the fan magazines, um, and Activision was running running out of money, so they you know they didn't get a whole lot of marketing support. Hmm. Now, around this time, also one of the uh, MediaGenic was also trying to get into the uh, productivity software arena. Uh, was that something that you guys were aware of, and what was the internal thought uh, thought or opinion of that move from the Infocom uh, veterans? I don't remember. Very well. I can you name a couple of products they put out? I that don't have... even know if they ended up putting out any of the products. I know they uh, they started a separate division. I think they did put at least one or two products out. I don't remember. I mean, we once Bruce took over, we did not have a very high opinion of of uh, Activision slash MediaGenic. And one of the things he did, which really, really screwed up morale at Infocom, was he sued us. Well, he sued a bunch of us. He, um, with the sale, as I mentioned, went through on June, Friday the 13th of June, uh, 1980. <laughs> there was a two year period where Activision could claw back money from the, uh, indemnifying shareholders, which was not all the shareholders, but they were the major shareholders. Fortunately, I was not one of the people who had to indemnify. I, I didn't own enough stock. But people like Mark Blank and Joel Perez and Dave Lebling and Chris Reeve and Al Veza, the, you know, the, the founders and therefore key, um, shareholders, all had to sign, uh, you know, to indemnify Activision if it were to be found that there was some sort of fraud or, you know, the books had been cooked or something like that. Well, you know, two years went by and nothing had ever even been hinted at as any problem. But on the two-year anniversary of the sale of the company, FedEx packages arrived on all these people's doorsteps, basically saying, you owe us money. No um, way. Oh, oh, yes, way. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it was, but, you know, the, the original contract called for, 
you know, they had to, within the two years, they had to specify precisely what it was that was being claimed and why. And of course, he wasn't doing that. He was just basically saying, you know, we got, we got screwed and we want some money back. And they were, you know, immediately, of course, you know, bullshit, you know, <laughs> the contract and, and what in the world did we do wrong? So I remember he came out to meet with me. So this happened, you know, June 88. And Joel left fall of 88. And I was essentially left, uh, you know, Joey Barra had been brought out by, um, by Bruce from, he was a high level producer, like executive producer at Electronic Arts for many years. He's a really good guy. Um, he, he was brought out to head up, um, product development at, Infocom. And when Joel left, he essentially took on Joel's role, although I still had a pretty significant uh, kind of co-role with him. And then he left. He went back out to the West Coast. And so I was left running the place. And Bruce came out, took me to dinner, and, you know, basically tried to, you know, talk me into implore that I, you know, turn this company around, you know, that, that, you know, we had to improve morale. We had to, you know, we had to get our, you know, act together. And I said, well, Bruce, you're making it really difficult by this lawsuit. I mean, yeah, you know, only a few people are still at the company that you're suing, but we know all the people you're suing and, and, and it's all viewed internally as completely unfair that, you know, what did we do? What, you know, what was fraudulent? What, 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 did, what books did we cook? And his response to me was, we overpaid. You guys weren't worth what we paid. And I said, but that's irrelevant to the clawback clause. <laughs> but, okay, with 2020 hindsight, maybe you overpaid, but that doesn't give you the right to claw the money back. And he said, well, I think a, you know, a jury of my peers in a courtroom will, you know, will view it as only fair that we get get some of this money back. Wow. And I said, well, you know, that's not the deal and that's not, you know, that's not helping turn this company around or morale. And, you know, so we kind of, <laughs> I remember after dinner sitting in his rental car with the little dome light on talking, you know, into the night. And, you know, finally getting out of that car feeling totally frustrated that he just didn't get it. He didn't get the fact that suing these guys wasn't going to go anywhere. I said, they'll fight you to the death as a matter of principle. And he's like, ah, no, people say that they all end up settling. You know, he just oh, figured geez. he was going to squeeze some money out of them. Well, they fought it for years. And they, you know, they figured as Activision was running out of money that eventually the lawsuit would be dropped for lack of, you know, cash at Activision. What they didn't count on was Activision gave the lawsuit in lieu of paying their lawyers. They gave the lawyers the right to collect. Oh, so no. the lawyers then had, you know, their interns and whatever. Was something, you know, if somebody's got some free time, oh, yeah, work on that lawsuit with Infocom. And so it. It just dragged on. And so the Infocom guys ended up spending like 500000 in legal fees. Um, who knows how much Activision spent? It was significantly more. Um, and eventually, just to make it go away, they offered $10,000 to, to settle. And the lawyers took it. So it went away for a time. <laughs> it was the kind of thing that just, you know, was the kiss of death. You know, the fact that you're suing the founders and, 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 and a couple of the key people who are still there, like Dave Leveling and Chris Reeve, were being sued. And it was like, and Tim Anderson, you know, no, I, maybe not Tim. I can't remember if Tim or Stu were, were um, shareholders who had to sign that or not. They, they were both founders, but they, neither of them had a ton of stock. So they may not have been indemnifying shareholders. I'm not positive. But, you know, there were several people who were involved who were being sued 
and we were still friends. I mean, Mark Blank had left, but he was working for us as a contractor, working on um, Border Zone, for instance. So, I mean, we were still, you know, very much in touch with him. And it was not viewed as at all fair that these folks were being sued. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That, that just reeks of a desperation move to try to claw back the money, which at, at the end of the day, I mean, wasn't going to add up to all that much anyway in comparison with the financial troubles that the company was in. I'll, but, I'll, I'll tell you, a, you know, another, uh, another level to that was the following year. Um, so as the company's been shut down, um, a bunch of people were laid off, including people like Steve Moretzky in May. And it was, you know, announced that, you know, what was left of the company was going to be being shut down over the next couple of months. But people like you know, Gabriella Cardi, who had been there from pretty you know, almost the beginning, um, she was the first person that they hired to work full time, uh, other than Mark and Joel. Uh, she was still there. She was, you know, she had been running sales for many years and she, you know, had contacts with all the, uh, distribution channels and whatever. Um, then she knew the company inside out. So she was kept around. I was kept around and the people who were absolutely necessary to get those four last graphics games out the door on four platforms. So we had 16 SKUs to ship we were kept around until those, until they shipped. Um, Towards the end of that process, um, oh, by the way, I'll, I'll tell another quick story, which is, so they wanted me to stay, and I'm a vice president at that point. And up to that point in time, you know, a VP laid off from Infocom or, or Activision got a pretty good, you know, package. And, you know, I knew they were running out of money. And, you know, they didn't offer me a very good, you know, severance package. So, so I, I thought about it and said, look, this is, you know, less than anybody has gotten in the past. Obviously, I understand you don't have a lot of cash. You also have a lot of stuff here. And my intent is to start a company after I leave. And it would be actually fairly useful to have some of this stuff that you will probably throw away or sell for 10 cents on the dollar. How about I put a list together of office equipment and whatever that you're probably going to view as basically worthless that is part of my seventh package. So they actually went for me and I, I still have, I still use the, the desk I sat at at Infocom is here. <laughs> in oh, my cool. Um, the filing cabinets that I took when I left Infocom, which are those, you know, well, at the time they were well over a thousand dollars, the lateral, tall steel case, really high end filing cabinets. Yeah. Uh, you know, I still have those. I still have, you know, a whole bunch of, I still have my Mac <laughs> from really? in my Mac sack. And every now and then I haven't started up for several years, but every now and then I pull it out and start it up and it still starts up instantaneously and runs the Infocom games. Um, <laughs> I guess I fear turning it on for fear that it won't start. And that I won't be able to keep saying that. So <laughs> I haven't heard that. But anyway, um, the head of personnel at Activision came out to talk to me. And as part of this lawsuit against the shareholders, they had uh, basically issued a, a subpoena to me to uh, come to a deposition. And the head of personnel came out to talk to me about that. And he was trying to warn me that if I said anything that hurt the lawsuit, it could really impact my severance package. And I said, do you have any idea what you're saying and what would happen if I go to the shareholders and tell them that you're basically threatening me if I tell the truth? And he said, oh, my God, you can't possibly do that. Oh, my, oh, you know, Bruce would have a fit and you'd lose your severance package. And blah, blah. <laughs> and, uh, I immediately got in touch with the shareholders and their lawyer. And the lawyer wanted to go into court and say, they have abused this process. They are trying to suborn a, a, a witness to this. 
you should throw this whole case out. And but they they got back to me and said, Mike, if we do this, you're almost certainly going to lose your severance package. Is that important to you? And I said, damn right, it's important to me. So they didn't. I give them tons of credit because they spent many more years fighting the, the thing. And they had a pretty strong case for throwing it out of court based on, on what had transpired. That That is quite honorable. I mean, yeah, that that's a tough call to make. What they should have done <laughs> is said, we will pay your severance package if you lose it. And it would have oh. been way cheaper for them. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> is what you have said. But at the time, <laughs> I guess they probably figured, it, you know, the lawsuit wasn't going to go on a whole lot longer and, you know, it would fall apart. But unfortunately, it went on a whole, many more years. That's true. Well, that's, Monday morning quarterbacking is always hard, especially yeah. with those kind of things. So, uh, so at, that's the point when you, so this would have been when they shut down the East Coast operations or, had they and uh, they moved, I think one project back uh, west, or were you already in Cal? Uh, did they move you out to California to uh, ship those last products? When I said, you know, they you know shut us down. I, I, that's a little overstating. So they offered about ten people to move to the West Coast. So it included people like Steve Moretsky. Um, there were a couple. You know, programmers, um, um, well, I can't think of his name. Rob Sears, who I had hired, uh, as product manager, kind of, in a, you know, marketing role, uh, after Gail Sisko left, uh, Rob Sears came in. And so he had done things like, um, um, battle tech and quarter staff. And I can't remember exact time frame on those games, but I know at least one of those wasn't was still being worked on as they were shutting us down. So Rob happily moved to the West Coast. One of our programmers moved to the West Coast. There were about four people who took them up on the offer. I told them when they told me what their plan was, I said, You're not gonna get any of the key people. Um and they said, "Oh, you'll see. Everybody loves moving to the West Coast. You know, they're they're, you know, they're all going to take us up on this." And I just shook my head and said, "No, they're not." And what they got was a couple of people whose stated intent was let them pay for my move, and then I'll immediately start looking for a job out there because I kind of wanted to move to the West. Coast. Right? And so they weren't really getting any value out of that. They were spending money on moving somebody who was was going to jump ship. Rob Sears hung around with them, but Rob had, had only been at the company for a short time. So he wasn't like a, you know, he wasn't one of the key old timers. Um, but people like, I can't remember if Dave Lebling was on that list or not, but you know, he certainly did move. Uh, one of the, um, micro programmers, um, no, I'm forgetting his name, uh, took them up on the offer, but, there were, you know, they lost all the key people. Everybody who was like the core of what made Infocom Infocom was gone. Yeah. And when uh, you leave and you said, uh, said that you wanted to start something else new, where do you go? What is your next move? So I had decided first to take a break take a little bit of time off and recharge my batteries because I had been working pretty hard. And also I got really, really ill in the spring of 89. I did a trip to England uh, to meet with Magnetic Scrolls and Douglas Adams and I can't remember what else, and Activision Europe. And somehow in that trip, possibly on the plane ride, I... I came down with mononucleosis. I didn't realize it Ooh. had, it. but I, you know, I got a pretty bad case of mononucleosis as an adult, you know, as somebody who was at the time at 30, 36. Um, at first I thought I had the mumps because my throat puffed out like you know, insanely. Um, but I went into the doctor and they said, no, you have mono. And it, 
I was out of work for at least a month and I was so ill. I couldn't hold a book up in bed. Wow. And I had never in time bought a television. I still didn't own a TV. So I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't sleep. I was just bored out of my mind. And then when I did go back to work, I was still really weak. And I was still sleeping way more than normal. So it was many months before I got back to normal. So I was only half time from, I think I came down with the illness in like March and I went back like half time, April, May, June sort of time frame. And my last day was sometime in mid July, I think. So like it was half time of the, I've been paid full time, but because of the medical problem, I was only working about half time. For, of course, half time for me was probably 30 hours a week, but still. <laughs> um, so what well, I plan to do is start a, another mail order business. Um, since Zork Users Group had been so successful and running the mail, I, I, I never gave up running the mail order operations at Infocom. And even when Activision took that over at some point, I mean, they, they made us give up our mail order fulfillment and move into theirs, which ended up being a disaster because it was way more expensive and way less accurate. Um, we, um, you know, I had kind of an affinity for it. I felt like I, you know, I had some understanding for it. You know, mail order businesses were still quite successful. This is well before the, the internet. And, um, I had some ideas. Uh, one was I was always a fan of maps. And uh, there weren't very many map stores. Um, on that trip to England, uh, I had gone to – there's a famous map store in London that uh, Sherlock Holmes goes to. And it's still there. It's still, you know, uh, same name, same location. And I went there and I was just absolutely enthralled with the place. I was like in heaven, right? And mm. there was a place in this, the Stanford Mall in Silicon Valley, actually called Hornbrooks, uh, like Dornbrook with a, an H instead of a D, um, that was a map and travel book store. And I spent hours there one day, just kind of checking out all the inventory, watching the customers. And eventually, at the end of it, talking to the manager and saying, you know, you know, I love maps, and I've been thinking of starting a, a map catalog. And just kind of, you know, taking his temperature, trying to get a sense for, you know, what, what his interest level one might be in that or whatever. But it, you know, one of the things that occurred to me is I couldn't find any evidence of a map catalog out there. And you can justify a mail order business way before you can justify a store. Now, obviously, there were not very many map stores. There was none in Boston. There was one in New York. There was one in London. There was this one in Silicon Valley. There were, you know, scattered around in major metro areas. But most people did not have an easily accessible map store. And my sense was you could probably put together a pretty good mailing list of people who are interested in maps and travel, I mean, I, you know, I would go beyond just maps into like Michelin guides and, you know, that sort of thing also. But, um, so I started down the path of creating that business. And one of my ideas is something else that I didn't think was being done by anyone was in that map store in London, I fell in love with an old map that was, I think the year was 1608 on it and it had been hand colored. And it was pretty good size. It was probably, you know, four feet tall by three feet wide or something like that. Pretty good size. And it was being sold for, as I recall, about 3,800 US dollars. It was like 2,000 and some odd pounds. And it was claimed to be one of only two left in existence. And it was of the northeastern American coastline, basically from around Chesapeake Bay through Nova Scotia, but it was all slightly off, you know, the way old maps are, which yeah, I love, where Cape Cod is at the wrong angle and the Hudson River is like, you know, at a weird angle and way bigger than it actually is. And, you know, just 
And then, like, the interior, since they knew nothing about the interior, was essentially, you know, there be dragons almost. You know, it was <laughs> beautiful illustrations to fill the space of, like, Native Americans smoking a peace pipe and stuff like that. It was gorgeous. And I, I lusted, I still wish I had purchased it. I, I really wanted to buy it. But I thought, you know, there is no copyright on a map like that. I could buy famous old maps and really accurately and, and high quality reproduce them. And I could sell, I could put in this catalog, you know, this gorgeous map, you know, for 40 or 50 bucks, right? And then yeah. so you could buy the original from for 10,000 or you could buy this perfectly gorgeous copy for only $50, right? But yeah. I would then, as a business, be able to buy all these wonderful maps that I that I lusted after. So that was my plan. I was going to start a map catalog, and I, after taking a little bit of time off and doing, you know, I think I I did a drive up to uh, maritime provinces in Canada just to take a break. When I, you know, I, I took a little bit of time off, and then I started to work on this catalog. And then that catalog arrived in the mail. <laughs> oh no. Somebody else had the same idea. <laughs> and it wasn't exactly my idea. They didn't have the old maps, for instance, but they had tons and tons of maps. It was from Rand McNally, right? So they had a brand name in maps and it was a beautifully done catalog with more than I'd probably be able to put into a catalog. And they were smart enough to figure out to mail it to me. And I thought, all right, I don't think I can go up against them. I, I, you know, I was just going to fund this myself. So it wasn't going to have a ton of starting capital. And I figured trying to go up against Ben McNally in mail order with maps was probably not the best idea. <laughs> so yeah. I ended up pivoting and I'd read something about you know, 900 numbers were sort of taking off. And a lot of it was, I don't know if you know what a 900 number is. It's a, yeah. it's a pay phone number, right? And a lot of it was sleazy stuff like, you know, horoscopes and pick your number for the lottery and, 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 uh, you know, talk dirty to somebody and that kind of thing. <laughs> Dating sites and stuff. But I thought, you know, how about doing something that actually has real value to people. Cell phones were just starting to take off. And they were just starting to talk. There was a, a local version of 900, which was 976. And it had done very, very well in New York City, but they'd never launched it in the Boston, in, in New England, in New England Telephone. And they were about to launch 976 in New England. And they were going to, a lot of 976 didn't allow cell phones to call it, Boston was going to. And I thought, how about if I just target the cell phone customer who's mostly at that time business people and sales guys, the company's paying for the phone. So what they run up on charges on, it doesn't matter that much to them. And I do services of interest to the sorts of folks who have cell phones and are traveling a lot. And so I decided to do a uh, a traffic oriented like you could call in and choose one of five areas around Boston and get the traffic information in more detail just for your area and not learn about the traffic in an area you could care less about because the radio traffic you know they spend you know ninety percent of the time on stuff you you don't care about and you want more detail on what you do care about. And I made a deal with the folks who provide all that service for the um, radio stations. It was called Metro Traffic. And they agreed they would, you know, for a fee, call in like once an hour and update all my traffic information for my five different areas. I also made a deal with Logan Airport in Boston. I said, do you, would you like to have a service that would tell people where there are parking spaces? Because people cruised all over the place looking for parking spaces. They said, oh, my God, we would love it. People call us all the time. They drive us crazy. Like, they agreed that they would call in and say where the parking spaces were for free if I would just take that off of them. 
So I was going to do multiple services that aimed at cell phone users who did a lot of travel. And unfortunately, the day before 976 launched in the Boston area, they changed their mind and they turned off. They decided they weren't going to support cell phones. Oh, wow. The whole business plan fell apart. <laughs> so then I said, okay, it's time to find a job. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent about a year on all of that, and uh, January '91, I started working in not in the games business. I ended up working at a company called Epsilon Data Management, which is in the Boston suburbs, founded by some MIT guys, and they had started with at their fraternity at MIT. They computerized the list of all their alumni that they, you know, occasionally wanted to mail to, to ask for donations or whatever. And then once they did that, all the other fraternities started saying, Hey, can you do that for us too? And then they realized, Hey, we could start a business. So they started this business and then they started going after charities and, you know, they got things like the Red Cross and AARP and, you know, uh, and then they said, Hey, the corporate America, the marketing departments at major corporations can't get the time they need from IT because finance and accounting always come first. How about if we become essentially the IT department for marketing departments at major companies? And so they became, I mean, when I joined them, they had 700 consultants and programmers working for them. And they hired me, and they had just been purchased by American Express. They hired me to create a product called Business Builder. They wanted to go from, they were doing all this on mainframes. They wanted to build a product for the PC, for smaller companies. And I put a team together, and uh, American Express was backing this. And American Express had decided uh, to give people... Uh, Basically, they were going to only let their uh, folks who took the card could get this software. Uh, so you had to be an American Express card acceptor. But what they would do as a bonus when you got the software is they would start it up with everyone who'd ever shopped in your store who'd use an American Express card, their mailing information. So you could uh, target them directly. And, you know, I thought that was brilliant and it would, you know, mean that a lot of stores would want to get this software. And um, so we went down the path of creating the software. Uh, we got it, you know, we're, we got it to beta. We worked on, uh, we made a deal with, I made a deal with Fujitsu that um, tied into their um, uh, cash registers. So somebody, you know, you, you, everything integrated. Um, and then there was a big shakeup at American Express. <laughs> and folks who championed us were axed. And American Express cut budgets overall. They laid off a bunch of people. They cut budgets by like a billion dollars. And all funding for our project was killed. <laughs> Even though we were already in beta with, you know, some happy customers. It was like, this sucks. <laughs> And that was, well, I also then got a very nice severance package because I was still part of American Express and they still gave very nice severance packages. So then that morphed into, we, when we were getting wind of the fact that American Express might be changing course and, uh, before they cut the funding, they cut access to the list. They said, no, we've changed our mind. Who knows? The florist might get a list of his customers, but his brother-in-law might run a porn business and mail to them. And, you know, we just can't, we can't take that risk. So they turned off the fact that we were going to be able to provide the list, which was a huge part of our selling proposition, right? So yeah. internally at Epsilon, we came up with a solution for that, which was some folks in our R&D group were doing very early work on neural net modeling. And they had found that they could take, I mean, Epsilon had all these databases from all these different companies. 
And then they bought databases to overlay information on top of that. So there was a company called MetroMail out of Chicago that had pulled together all of the direct mail information from all the top catalogs. So they knew they had almost every American household, like 90% of American households were in their database. They knew who was in that household. They had all the census data pulled in. They had what you bought from all these catalogs. And so they had a ton of information on people. So Epsilon would overlay that information on this other information they had and then create models of that to try to figure out. So this group had come up with a way of making a neural net model using like the MetroMail data and someone's list and say, find more people who look like the customers I already have or the good customers I already have. And it was working fairly well. So they, when they shut my project down, I went back in and said, would you guys be okay if I took that idea and ran with it? And they said, yes. And so I went to Metro Mail in Chicago and said, I have this idea. It need, means I need to get your database, uh, which is your, you know, your pride and joy and crowning achievement, right? It's, it's all of your, your company's assets. You need to let me as a little startup have that. <laughs> And I am going to be using it to create models for folks. Well, they only had, I think, two or three companies that they had allowed to have access to their data directly. Epsilon was one of them. Uh, there were like two others. And then there was me. <laughs> and so every quarter, quarter, they would send me 200 of those big nine-track nine tapes off of a um, off of a mainframe computer. Uh, and then I would have to read those with a, I bought a tape machine and I would read those. And I would condense it down onto one little um, cartridge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it was, it was very condensable. I mean, it was very, you know, um, easily compressed. And um, there was far better technology than the nine track tapes. But anyway, I, I started a company called Sound, uh, Sound Information, and we were going to be creating these models um, for folks. And I did it all on my own dime. And uh, I got a couple of customers and then got a big hit with New England Telephone. Um, through their direct marketing firm. The woman who ran their direct marketing firm had been an executive at Epsilon before I was there. So I didn't meet her there. But she had a, you know, obviously a very high opinion of Epsilon. And when I told her I had been there and this was technology from Epsilon, she gave it a try. And we did a model for 9X in New York, the New York telephone of, um, folks who made collect calls and they wanted to do a marketing campaign to the folks to, to kind of figure out who's currently making collect calls and who looks like them. Who should we be targeting? And I did this model and they tried it and it was phenomenally successful. And they learned something. One of the little side things I did is I bought a, uh, a product called map info that ran on the Mac uh, on the uh, IBM PC. And just as part of the report I gave them, I, I showed them where their customers were, zip code by zip code, county by county. I did a couple different maps. And then I did it divided by the population in the zip code or the county. And they were flabbergasted because they knew they were big in places like the Bronx. And they just figured, okay, poor people use collect. But if you divided by population, it was actually a lot of fairly wealthy suburbs were actually bigger customers per capita. And that was like totally eye-opening to them. And it turned out a lot of it was college students calling home to the parents. And they, for some reason, didn't know that. And so they were just delighted with this. And they wanted to do a bunch of different models with us. And so I figured, figured like, okay, I'm in business, but I needed to raise money. I was running out of money. I, now, I, uh, what year is this approximately? How far are we into this? This is, uh, 
So late eighty, late ninety three, early ninety four. So I I left Epsilon in January ninety three. I um I worked on getting the whole um, Metro Mail thing set up through the rest of that year and got my first customers. It was around the end of ninety three, and okay. I. Um, I was running out of money. I basically run through virtually all my savings. And uh, I take that back. It was into 94 because I actually was doing it at the same time I was working on. So I had BAFO going also. Um, so yeah, it was into 94. I take that back. But, um, the problem we ran into was I needed cash and I had lined up investors who were, I, I was trying to raise a half million dollars. I did, I went through a whole um, competition at MIT for business models and I won. I got, I, I you know, I, I was like singled out as th- this guy who was, um, was called Zero Stage Capital. He, he was uh, very, very highly regarded um in the angel investment community in the Boston area and the venture capital community in the Boston area. And when I finished, uh, present, uh, when all of us finished our presentations, he held up my business plan and he said, I get 50 to 70 business plans a week. And I'm thinking, and he's going to tear me apart. And he said, and this is the best one I've seen in over a year. And I was like, Oh wow. my God, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm in. Right. And so I talked to him immediately afterwards and he said, you're too small. The amount you are looking for is too small for me. But, you know, uh, if you go to angel investors, you're going to, you're going to raise the money. No question. And so I found three angels who were willing to put up a quarter million between them, but they wanted me to get that matched. I also found Atlas Ventures, which was a major venture firm, uh, looked at my plan and said, we can't make that small an investment. But the partner said to me, just go back and redo your plan such that you need $3 million. And I do it. <laughs> I thought about it seriously. I was like, but I don't need $3 million. And, and I was thinking stupidly, I didn't realize at the time that I'd have to give him six times as much ownership. I learned much later. That's not how it works. <laughs> you basically, uh, just inflate the value of the company and say, you know, I'm raising, you know, three million at a ten million valuation. You give them the same percentage. <laughs> um, they would have gone for it probably, but I didn't know that. Well, anyway, I turned him down, and he told me, "No one ever turns us down." <laughs> and then uh, the uh, woman who was the main conduit into Ninex, this woman who ran this direct marketing firm in Boston, who had been the ex-Epsilon employee, was diagnosed with stage four cancer oh. and had to stop work. And suddenly, the whole connection into Ninex, all the other projects that were planned, and these were like, I mean, that project was like a $50,000 model, and they were chart- looking to do even bigger ones. And by the way, it, my, my cost was like one tenth of that. I mean, it was like really, really high margin. Um, all of a sudden, my main customer is either on hold or dead. I have to go back to the investors and, you know, I have to tell them, right? So I said, look, you know, we've had a setback. So then they dropped and then I was running out of money. <laughs> so I had no choice. I just had to shut down. And so then I basically switched to more, I wasn't full-time BAFO right away, but I think it was half-time BAFO and then eventually full-time BAFO. So BAFO Games was Steve, Steve Moretzky, eventually after doing four games at Legend, decided he wanted to start a company. And he came to me and asked me to be president. And I said, well, I'm, I'm you know, running this other business. I'm like, I can't. You know, I can't take this on full time, but but I'll help you. I'll help you get it going. So um, so 
Botho. Yes. So Steve uh, had decided it was time to start his own company. But he also you know, knew, knew he needed co-founders in order to make it work. So he went to two of us who um, you know, he knew and trusted from way back. Actually, uh, both Leo DaCosta and I met Steve through LSC, the MIT film series. Um, I didn't really know Leo very well. Leo uh, and Steve, once I left for University of Chicago, uh, Leo, after that, became chairman of LSC, and Steve was still involved, and that's how Steve got to know him. I I kind of knew him, but I didn't know him very well. I'm, I viewed it as uh, the transitive property of friends. I was friends with Steve. Steve was friends with Leo, and <laughs> he wanted the three of us to start this company. So, and he wanted me to be president. So, I told him I'd help help him, and you know maybe be able to work part time, but you know kind of don't count on a whole lot of time from me. I'll help you get it going, and I'll help you get the first deals in place. So. Um, we, Steve and I flew out, so, ah, got to figure out how best to tell this story. Um, we got word that somebody we knew, I knew, I knew this, uh, Mark Blank ended up working for, um, the record group at Warner Brothers. Uh, they were doing, remember, um, CDI? Yeah doing some CBI stuff and Mark ended up working there and he ended up um, the guy that ran the group I'm thinking on his name I have his book here somewhere is it on this pile no oh jeez why can't I think of his name it'll come to me um, Mark had been working with uh, somebody there uh he had had moved on, but um, then oh, I really should remember this guy's name. This guy left Warner to take a job at Media Vision. Media Vision was a company that, when CD-ROM launched, there was a a couple of years where a couple of companies boomed by selling CD-ROM drives and Media Vision was one of those companies. They had this massive increase in sales. They went public and raised a, over a hundred million dollars in their public offering. And then they decided that one of the things that was being done was these CD-ROM drives were being bundled with some game software as just like you know, a little bonus that came with your hardware. But they yeah. were paying these game companies like, you know, a dollar a copy or something, and then selling millions and millions of these drives. So they were sent that, sending millions to these game companies, and they thought, geez, for the amount we're sending these companies, we could own these games. We could just, we could just make our own games. Little did they know that, you know, one in a hundred games actually is successful and they were picking the ones that were successful to go in the package and that they could not guarantee that the ones that they decided to fund were going to be successful. They learned that the hard way. But anyway, word came that they were putting aside, I forget the dollar or not, it was a large dollar amount. It was well over 10 million. It was tens of millions of dollars, I think, to create a game group within media vision that would contract with developers to make games and they were putting the guy whose name i'm forgetting in charge of it so i thought aha <laughs> we have a we have a new person who needs content has a massive budget and we have a connection to it so we got in touch and we set up a meeting and so um on Monday, January, I forget if it was the 18th or the 19th, 1994, we were set to meet um, with this guy and his team at their offices at 9 a.m. So I don't know if you remember, but back in the day, if you flew 
and stayed over a Saturday night, you got a much lower airfare than if you flew on Sunday. Yeah. Um, basically a way of giving a discount to non-business people because business people could care less about, you know, saving money. You know, they wanted their weekend. Those of us who were more money conscious would be perfectly happy to fly on Saturday. So <laughs> Steve and I flew out on Saturday. So we had Sunday to kill, right? And it was January. So it was cold and miserable in Boston, but it was gorgeous in Los Angeles. It was, uh, sunny Santa Ana winds. It was like 80 degrees and dry and gorgeous. And we decided we were staying in Westlake Village, which is way western and uh, in the uh, San Fernando Valley. We decided we were going to go to Disneyland. Well, that's the other end of the metro area. <laughs> it was like a <laughs> six-mile six drive through nonstop suburbia. I mean, it was just you know, one of the first times I really got a picture of how spread out L.A. is. So we went to Anaheim and went to, to Disney that day. And then at some point, and by the way, we had not brought short sleeve shirts. We had not brought short pants. We, you know, we were dressed for, for Boston and for business meeting. So we were dying in the heat and everybody else is like in flip flops and shorts and we're walking along you know, around with long sleeve shirts and long pants on. And I turned to him at some point as we were walking along and said, you know, I can kind of see why people live out here. And he said, yeah, you'd never catch me out here because of the earthquakes. And I swear to God, I said, you know, it would be just our luck, wouldn't it? Well, guess what? Next okay. morning, 4.30 in the morning, <laughs> we were sharing a room. We had separate beds, but we were sharing a room. Steve, the, the initial shock threw Steve out of his bed, threw me up in the air. I ended up grabbing onto my mattress and holding on for dear life as it was like, you know, a bucking bronco. And, you know, we were on the top floor. It was the fourth floor of the Hyatt in Westlake. And the building was shaking and moving in ways I didn't think a building could survive. I fully expected any second beams were going to fall on me and crush me. And that went on for 35 seconds, which feels like about five minutes, by the way, if you're in an earthquake. And then it stopped. And we were both fine, but it was pitch black in the room because we had all the lights out. But I noticed there was a little... Uh, red light on the TV. It's like, oh, we still have power. So I decided to turn the TV on, to figuring the public broadcast system that all my life is telling me in case of emergency, they were going to tell me what to do. Was going to tell me what to do. So I'm turning it on. Steve, Steve's yelling, we need to get out of here. I, said, I want to see what's, what they're telling us to do. And it was a newsroom in LA. It was one of the main TV stations, like one of the network stations in LA. And the camera was zoomed all the way back in a way that you normally didn't see the newsroom. There were all these desks. They were all empty except one. And that person was screaming and putting his hands over his head and crawling under the desk. And then the power went out. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> oh, boy, because I knew that was like many, many miles from us. So this was not just local. This was like, you know, this was a major quake. So and then I'm thinking the San Andreas fault might have given way. Oh, we might not have water. We're in a desert. We might be trapped here for weeks with no water. And so I went, I crawled into the bathroom in the dark and put the stopper down and started filling the bathtub with water. And Steve is yelling, what the hell are you doing? We got to get out of here. And I said, we need water. <laughs> so I put the bathtub with water, got dressed in the dark, and we, we worked our way down the hall. The emergency lighting didn't come up. And so we had no idea if there was a floor right in front of us. We're in pitch black. So I let him go first. And he's feeling his way down the hall, making sure there's a floor there. We get to the exit stairs, and they're pitch black also. And then, you know, stepping down step by step, making sure there's another step in front of us, all the way down to the first floor. And then open the door into the parking lot. And I remember just gasping at the sight, which is, you know, we're in a desert. It's dry as can be because of the Santa Ana winds. And there's no power on in the entire West Coast. So it's dark, right? You could see stars right down to the horizon. I'd never seen the sky so clear. I mean, I've been out at sea in a boat. It's hazier out at sea. I'd never been in a desert 
where there's no lights within hundreds of miles of you, right? It mm. was stunning. So we got in our rental car and backed it away from the building in case there was an aftershock that brought the building down on us so that we could listen to the radio and find out what was going on. Anyway, it gets to be, you know, dawn. And we realize, you know, there's some aftershocks and stuff. We realize it's not the San Andreas. And we realize it's not, it's bad, but it's not as horrible as it might be. And our building's been damaged, but not such that we can't stay in it. So at some point we're trying to figure out, okay, well, what do we do? Um, we knew where their office was and we asked the front desk if we could rent bicycles and they looked at us like we were nuts. And we said, well, you rent bicycles here, right? And they're like, yeah, but we got bigger things to deal with. And I'm like, just let us rent a couple bicycles. We need something to do. So we took a couple bikes and we rode around the area and we went to where their office was and we looked through the windows and it was a shambles. I mean, all the file cabinets had fallen and bookcases had tipped over and stuff. And we're like, okay, there's not much chance we're going to be meeting with them <laughs> here. Uh, eventually we got in touch with them in the morning and they said they might be able to pull something together in the afternoon at the guy whose name I'm keep forgetting's house. Um, it, was it Min Yi? No. Okay. No. Although I do, I do recognize that name. No, it's not an Asian. Um, oh, it's so annoying. Anyway. Um, Greg Roach? Yeah. Sorry, I'm going through the credits of one of Media Vision's games here, trying to figure out who it Oops. might be. Um, do a Google search on books about Warner Records. Because he wrote the book on Warner Records. He wrote all the um, liner notes for Frank Sinatra's records because Frank Sinatra liked his liner notes and demanded that he be the guy that wrote the liner notes. So he had a guaranteed job because of that. Stan um, Cornyn? Stan Cornyn. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, welcome, welcome. And it's so embarrassing and I can't remember a name like that because I know the guy and I know <laughs> I know it would come up eventually. You know, Later on, I'd say, oh, yeah, Stan Cornyn. Anyway. They said we might be able to get together at Stan's house later, and they would get back to us. So about three in the afternoon, one of his folks, um, Linda Rich, drove to our hotel, picked us up, and took us to Stan's house, which was, you know, you know, probably within a mile of where we were staying. And, you know, his house had cracks and stuff. Linda was telling us that her house had pretty serious damage. I mean, it hadn't collapsed or anything, but it was going to be hundreds of thousands to fix it. Um and slowly at Stan's house, various other people from his team arrived. And everyone's got their stories to tell, right? So, you know, it took a while before we had got around to any business. Um, one of the little side things I need to tell you is I generally had an issue with Steve. Steve had 21 game ideas. <laughs> wow. 21 different things that he'd, you know, fleshed out with the, at least a, a page and, you know, maybe, you know, a whole treatment. And he liked to talk about a bunch of them or all of them. And I kept telling him, don't do that. You give people too many choices and they don't know how to, how to pick. They want what you, they, what you think is the best. And even though you can't decide between your children, he would be better off if you just told them, this is the one I want to do because they really don't have a clue what's going to work and what isn't. And they think you do. <laughs> and <laughs> if you're positive about a game, you can sell it. But if you give them 21 game ideas, they're not going to know what to do. <laughs> so I've been telling them that for a while with, you know, various other meetings we were having. Um, and we are, you know, in this like very loopy sort of, giddy we survived mood that people yeah. get into going through a disaster like that and all of us were in that mood and you know stands opening bottles of wine from his wine cellar and at some point i think we'd already started talking about games by then but at some point he decided to order pizza and that pizza place came and delivered but because the power was down the internet was down they couldn't take credit cards and he didn't have enough cash to pay the guy. 
I always have tons of cash. I probably shouldn't say that in a public <laughs> forum. I, since I was a little kid, I always wanted to have enough money on me to deal with kind of any sort of disaster I might run into. You know, if I have to, you know, pay a tow truck driver in the middle of nowhere, a couple hundred dollars to get me somewhere, you know, I want to be able to do that. So I always have cash. So I was able to pay the pizza guy. But anyway, Steve starts in on, you know, telling his game ideas and they're eating it up. They're in this like totally giddy, you know, loving it mood. And, you know, he's going through game after game after game. And, you know, generally, I think this is a disaster, but everyone was in such a giddy mood. It's like, oh, what the hell? And we got to the point where, I mean, there was a couple game ideas that they're brilliant, they're hysterical, but no one would ever put them out. <laughs> and he's so good at doing the, the 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 story behind them. I mean, you know, he tells his story and gets to a punchline, and you're just cracking up. Um, one of them, I'm not even sure I should tell you both. <laughs> one of them, <laughs> the fairy bug, the fairy godfather. <laughs> and he basically tells a story and, you know, it's like, you know, the Godfather movie, you know, you've, you've got the, the, the senior head of that family passes away and, and, uh, you know, the eldest brother Guido becomes the Godfather, but, you know, the, the, you know, competing mob kills off Guido and, you know, second oldest brother Alfonso takes over and blah, 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 blah. He tells us, you know, very rich story behind all of this. Um, and, you know, at some point, you know, the youngest brother, Bruce, who's never really liked guns or violence, and he's kind of into gardening and flowers arranging and blah, 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 blah. You know, it falls on him to become a fairy godfather. <laughs> so, uh, he tells that way better than I just did. But um, generally, I told him don't tell that story because no one is ever going to publish it. <laughs> and um, he even told that story. Um, I won't even go into the last one. Anyway, um, they went off into a huddle. And they said, you know, they came back and said, look, you know, we like a lot of these. And, you know, we love the fairy godfather and this other one, but no way would we ever be able to publish those. But there's 11 of them that we would like to publish. <laughs> so our question to you is, how big a company do you want to be? How quickly can you put out games? How would you like this to roll out? And, you know, Steve and I went into a little huddle and decided that, you know, a couple of his games were, and they also wanted to get a game out. This is January. They wanted the game out for that Christmas. So what could we do that would get out by Christmas? So, we had a, a a simpler game that wasn't a text adventure or you know adventure game. It was a collection of um, mini games that would tie together by a, a, essentially a board game, and it called it Hodge and Podge. And we thought that was the first one that we could do with a fairly simple engine, get it done in time. That we do one game year one, two games year two, three games year three. Let's, let's commit to a six game deal. And they said, okay. And literally we had no money in the company. The three of us put in a $10 bill and then cut it into three pieces. I still have my piece. And that was the capitalization of the company. Wow. <laughs> cut into three pieces. They said, uh, you know, we want you to start immediately. We don't want you to lose a day. Start buying equipment, start hiring people. It's going to take us at least a month to get the contract together. So we'll write you a check right now. And they wrote us a check for $20,000 then and there and handed it to us. <laughs> and um, we were in business. Wow, but, that's nuts. But, and we got a contract done in about, you know, four to six weeks uh, for the six games. And, you know, everything, you know, we hired people, we got office space, we got, you know, equipment and everything going. And uh, two or three months later, headline in the Wall Street Journal, SEC and FBI investigating media vision. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> and the stock was at a record high. It crashed. Then there were the shareholder lawsuits. 
And, you know, within, it turns out they had cooked the books beyond belief. They were moving inventory from one warehouse to another and calling it sales. I mean, it was complete fraud. Their whole IPO was complete fraud. Now, the guys that we were dealing with weren't even in the same city. They were, you know, the company was headquartered up in the Bay Area. These guys were down in, in the LA area and they didn't work for the company, you know, in that time period. They had only recently been hired. So they were totally innocent of all this, but you know, they got caught up in it obviously because the company went bankrupt and they sold our game and our contracts to Virgin Interactive, as I recall. And the group at Virgin that bought that then got laid off. I mean, we had problem after problem after problem after bought Um The next major deal we made was with um, Warner Interactive. And I thought, okay, you know, $30 billion company. They're not going to go under on us. Nice and soft. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I worked into the contract, um, I'd learned – these folks never dream that they're going to be the reason for a contract to fail. So I was able to get them to say, if for no fault of ours, you cancel this, um, you owe us the next three milestones. And they're like, oh, that'll never happen. So they agree to it in a heartbeat. And then, you know, we get partway through the development of the game and they shut down Warner Interactive completely. All the employees are like, let go. But Warner owns our contract, and they have to pay those next few milestones. So that was the game we made the most money on. It never saw the market, but we <laughs> And then we had uh, another uh, game idea that uh, we sold to Microsoft, and we had a handshake. And this was a time when Microsoft had never had a game released that hadn't been a success. Um, it was like, you know, printing money to do a deal with Microsoft at that point for a game. And they shook hands and said, okay, they wanted to do the space bar with us. Steve had this idea of, uh, you know, a, a cantina scene from Star Wars like bar where you're the only human and there's all these alien races and there's all this stuff going on and you need to make sense of it all. And so he had like 21 alien races. He had hysterical races. You know, he had the, the race that looked just like Polynesian, uh, drink mugs, you know, with the, with the Easter Island faces on them. Uh, they were the most powerful, wealthiest alien species and people kept picking them up <laughs> in the car, you know, mistaking them for a Polynesian drink. Yeah, on and on and on. Anyway, we had to deal with Microsoft. I fly back to the East Coast. The next day, Steve meets the folks at Rocket Science, which is down in the Bay Area, and they had, you know, raised some money. They had some good people, but they had never launched a game, and they didn't, you know, they weren't Microsoft, but they had Ron Cobb, and Ron was um, kind of famous. Ron started as a cartoonist for an alternative Bay Area paper. You know, so he was, you know, one of these people who was like a starving artist, right? And, but apparently one of the things he did fairly well was draw interesting aliens in his comic strips. So this obscure filmmaker at some point in making his film, decided he needed something to spice up the film. And he happened to be in the Bay Area, and he happened to know that Ron Cobb made these interesting aliens. So he asked Ron if he could design a bar scene for his little movie, Star Wars. And Ron paid $1,000 to design the cantina scene and all those aliens for Star Wars. Of course, it made his name. <laughs> and uh, he later went on to work with Cameron in a couple of films. Um, he was 
one of the art directors for either Alien or Aliens. I forget which. But he also apparently was uncredited by Steven Spielberg, who's Lucas's good friend, for designing E.T. And Spielberg gave him 1% of E.T. Wow, that's that's a pretty penny right there. He did very well on that. <laughs> so he was one of the founders of Rocket Science. And he looked like Santa Claus. Right? I shouldn't say that. I mean, I think he's still alive, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk this way. But at the time, this is 26 years ago, he looked like Santa Claus. Um, sometimes five years ago, whatever. Um, very, you know, white beard, uh, very twinkly eyed, very cheerful guy, very, you know, fun guy to be with. Anyway, Steve wanted to work with Ron and for Ron to design all the new. Steve had, you know, text and, and, and Steve can draw a little. So he had some, you know, level of drawing of what he thought these aliens looked like, but nothing like what Ron Cobb could do. So he called me and said, you got to back out of the Microsoft deal because I want to do the basic rocket science. And you're like, oh no, Steve, you're out of your mind. <laughs> rocket science, oh, they're likely to go under on us. So he went back to rocket science and Mike says you're likely to go under on us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 you know, we have enough money for five years. Well, five years assuming what, right? They were assuming all sorts of revenue. And if that didn't happen, they didn't have money for five years. So I had to call Microsoft and say, um, I'm terribly sorry to tell you this, but I hope we can keep the door open to working with you, but Steve wants to work with somebody else. And they said, do you realize we've never sold less than 300,000 copies of any game we've launched? And I said, I know this is a crazy decision, but, you know, for creative reasons, he wants to go with a different, different publisher. So we went with Rocket Science and as we finished the game, they went bankrupt. Wow. <laughs> um, the game came out. I mean, it did get sold. I'm forgetting now who picked it up. Somebody uh, else picked it up. I have it here. Uh, Bomico Entertainment Software. Yeah, that's not who had it. Who took it right Oh, Bandai time. Namco. Sorry. Yeah, okay. That might make sense. So yeah, somebody bought it, uh, but they were buying some other things too. And you know, whenever that happens, whenever you suddenly have someone else take over, it usually doesn't end up panning out really well. They don't have their, you know, they haven't been behind it since day one. They haven't been thinking about it for a year or two. They haven't got their soul invested in how it's going to launch. And so... Sorry, SegaSoft. SegaSoft. Thank it you, was thank Bandai you. Namco in Europe. Okay. Yeah. And then Sega in the Soft. U.S. it was SegaSoft. SegaSoft bought it, and they launched it. And they did an okay job, but they didn't do, you know, a Steve Moretzky fantastic game stellar job. It was probably the best game he ever wrote. It has two gigabytes. It took three CD-ROMs to hold the game. Wow. It's got, oh God, dozens of hours of audio. I think there, I forget how many audio actors we used. I mean, there, the audio is fantastic. The 3D animations are fantastic. It, it was just, I mean, a labor of love. I mean, we all killed ourselves to get it out the door um, just because we couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't see it dying. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we'd had so many things die at that point from companies going under on us. And that, th- you know, that company going under on us was kind of the final nail in the coffin. We just couldn't go on that way. So we all, all kind of went our separate ways. I went to work for Looking Glass as a consultant. Uh, heading up marketing there for a few months and they offered to make me VP of marketing. But at the same time, just about the time they made me that offer, I had met Harmonix. Now Looking Glass had like 72 people. Harmonix, I think had 15. Um, but I had this gut that the Harmonix guys 
you know, they were basically saying, we're going to make music interactive. And I believed them that music would become interactive. I didn't know if it would take two years or 20 years, but I thought they were right that it would. And I thought if they could have a long enough runway, that they could be the guys to make it happen. Mm. Looking Glass, I had this gut feel was had some serious underlying problem and they had a new owner that made no sense whatsoever the new owner just quick side story made his money by buying a very low-end uhf tv station in new york and reprogramming it and moving it up to being a much bigger audience and then selling it and he and his investors made a ton of money and then he, he looked around and said, what's up and coming? You know, games are up and coming. He had no game background whatsoever. He know, I don't think he even played games, but he viewed it as an industry that was like up and coming. So he looked at buying a game company with his backers. And he said, oh, these companies are all ridiculously overvalued. I know. I'll buy a software company that isn't overvalued, and I'll redirect them to making games. So he bought a company that literally made software for the U.S. government for things like Social Security. They made mainframe, boring, business-like software, and they were mostly COBOL programmers, and they were mostly guys like in their 50s and 60s. I went and visited when they were trying to get me to be VP, and I remember looking around and saying, you're going to turn these guys into game programmers? What in the world are you thinking? <laughs> this isn't that much work. The reason they bought Looking Glass was it wasn't working real well turning these guys into game programmers. So they thought if they bought Looking Glass, they would have this like team that could teach all these other folks how to make games. And I remember just shaking my head thinking, this is never going to fly. <laughs> and of course it didn't. <laughs> so yeah. I to go with harmonics instead of looking glass. All my friends from the game industry thought I was nuts. Um, but it ended up working out okay. Yeah. Yeah, a looking glass ended up shuttering their doors uh, I think May of 2000. Yeah, so so about, uh, two and a half years after I not even, yeah, about two and a half years after I left. And harmonics, it took a while. We were like a 10 year overnight sensation, right? But <laughs> our hero, all rock band, Dance Central, all you know, massive hits. And uh, we had a very, very nice exit. Uh, so you were, how long were you there for? 13 years. I started there in yeah. 97, and I stayed till late 2010. And... Uh, you were also there during the whole Guitar Hero rock band kerfluffle, or um, how did that actually come about that those two products existed? I think that's going to be have to be for another conversation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. The harmonic story, I got, oh, God, hours and hours and hours of things to tell you. So Okay. Uh, Tell you what, we will leave that for another interview at another time. No I'm, even, I'm even uh, toying with writing a book, and I actually started writing some stuff for it. I'm not sure. I, I feel like I need a uh, a co-author in order to really pull it off because it, it's a huge undertaking to write a book, as you may know. So yeah, yeah, it's it, as somebody who's. I uh, dabbled in self-publishing years and years ago. Uh, yeah, I know, I know how that is. Uh, but you have a hell of a story. I mean, uh, most people in the industry, they're lucky if they manage to work for one company that hits it big. But, uh, you've, I mean, got two of the biggest success stories, Harmonix and Infocom in the history of the industry. Uh, you have a ton of stuff in between. You've got the big names, uh, and you were, and I, I'm not, I, I, am I right in saying both Harmonix and, uh, Infocom share one attribute in common? They're basically 
they they got stuck in one genre and one genre alone. Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole mission of harmonics is to bring the joy of music to non-musicians, basically. You know, there's a whole story behind all of this, but um, that's their mission, and they're going to stick with it. Um, and they're still going, and they're still trying. They're still trying to create that next big hit, hit genre. And they are creative enough and and high quality enough that they keep getting projects. So, you know, they've got 105 people, I think, working there. And wow. they, they are doing, you know, multi-tens of millions of dollar, you know, gigs. Um, you know, nothing has quite, quite gelled yet. But um, they're, they're going to keep trying. Um, I, yeah, I mean, uh, the harmonic story, there's so many aspects of it. Um, and I do, and it's funny that you, you made that comment about, I, I had the luck of being in, in the two incredible situations because I, we, with the pandemic, we've been having, uh, get togethers, Zoom calls of the, uh, Infocom crowd. Oh, really? It's, it's, really fun because you know there are people some of them I haven't seen in you know 10 or 20 years and um, you know you get them in a zoom call and, and kind of catch up with them but it's very clear and you know some of these people have even mentioned uh, one of them uh, in the last call actually Betty Rock in the last call said she pities anyone whose first job was Infocom because they had no concept but that was not the way things normally are. <laughs> That's their life, wishing that they could recreate that and not succeed. And so it's always for everyone, you know, for many people who work at Infocom, I kind of, it's the rest of their career is a downer. And I always feel really fortunate that not only did I get the second crack at it, but harmonics in many ways was better than Infocom. Um, Infocom had serious high level, like board level, um, strategic disagreement, right? There, yeah. you know, Al and Joel and Mark, you know, often were not on the same way at all, right? And that often bubbled down to other levels where, you know, Al would go around people like Joel. And even, you know, badmouth people like Joel to other people in the company. I mean, just things that you just don't do and that are counterproductive. And and um, we never had anything like that at Hermes. I mean, the top executive committee totally had each other's backs. We completely trusted each other. And, you know, the culture of the company reflected all of that. And... So I didn't have any of the negatives that I had at, at Infocom. Um, I kind of almost purposely left on a high, right? And the Dance yeah. Central was a big success and was just coming, about to come out when I was leaving. And I could see that it was unlikely that the future was going to be as as great as the past had been for me. And I thought, you know, I'd rather leave on a high. And yeah. now I have other things I'd like to do. I've got, you know, plenty of money now. I'm not going to hurt the company by leaving right now. You know, I, I, I'm still a stockholder. I'm still a, you know, a, a, uh, you know, supporter. You know, I, I meet with folks there all the time. I talk with them all the time, but I'm, you know, I wanted to move on. And um, I'm very glad I did, but I'm also very, very glad uh, of the experience I had there. I mean, I got to work with the Beatles, for Christ's sake. I mean, uh, come uh, on. <laughs> so I, that that must have been amazing. It was, <laughs> it really was, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> and I actually think, you know, I've been really trying to figure out like what. What is the hook for the book? 
I, mean, I can just tell the Mike Dornbert story, but yeah, I don't think that's the fundamental good story there. You know, is there a way of turning it into a, you know, a book that goes way beyond just the Mike Dornbert story or the harmonic story even, but tells a, a story that kind of anyone could relate to? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, is it, and what's also the best hook? Like you could just tell, you could make this, the book, you know, kind of the making of Beatles rock band, you know, and then you get the Beatles into the title, right? <laughs> uh, and it's a wonderful story, but then you could tell all the other interesting stories of harmonics as sort of, you know, flashbacks. Um, and asides, um, or do you make it a book about company culture? And you know, there, there are like so many different ways I've thought about doing the book that, that it, it kind of it becomes a writer's block. You know, trying to figure out like I, I kind of need to know what I'm trying to accomplish before I start writing. But other people have just said, just start writing, just start writing. You know, as many of your thoughts down in paper as you can. And at some point, you might realize, oh, here's what the book is. <laughs> so I think uh, essentially that's what I started doing. That that actually sounds like the the best approach because yeah, I was just thinking. I mean, uh, the evolution of of the business as you saw it. I mean, especially your beginning, and this is obviously not part of the the interview, but just. You're beginning as, you know, the guy who essentially says, eh, screw university, is doing the newsletter and gets into this industry. There's, there's a fascinating tale of how the industry has evolved and changed and the big corporations that have tried to get into it and failed. And I guess, Ultimately, it's it's a guidebook for game design. The funny thing is, I'm actually not even really a gamer. Um, one of the things <laughs> I, I say to people is the last time I played Rock Band was with Tom Hanks and his wife. Oh, wow. And it's kind of one of these things where you shook hands with you know someone famous, you don't want to wash your hands. It's like, I don't want to play it again because then I can't say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And that's a whole story right there. <laughs> I was about to say, I, I, how did that come about? Uh, to say yeah, that for <laughs> exactly. It, it, we'll do the harmonics years um, as a separate podcast. But no, uh, I mean, it's a fascinating story. It's and there's plenty of people in the industry that have written books, but or books have been written about them. But it's usually a much shorter period of time. It's it's a more limited scope, um, and nah, this this is this this covers so much. It's it's amazing. Um, oh, but uh, I have one question that I ask um, everybody at the end of an interview, and so looking back on your career. What would you say was the one industry development that you had high hopes for that you were expecting a lot from that just fizzled out that basically didn't go anywhere? And what was the one industry development that you did not see coming that, as far as you're concerned, changed the game? Hmm. Going over a 40 year time frame, I'm trying to think like, uh, I think it's gonna really be kind of similar and physical. I mean, I can think of individual things that kind of fall in that category, but, but I'm not sure I'd put it at the very top of the list. I mean, one idea that happened in the 80s that I thought was a great idea that went nowhere was why, why not let the store itself make the disc and 
not have to make all this inventory that you didn't know was going to sell, right? We're on all different systems. You're trying to predict, you know, how many, you know, Atari 400s are going to sell, how many Commodore 64s are going to sell, blah, 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 blah. But you could have a package, an Infocom package sitting in the store with a whole bunch of individual cards for the individual system that they could pop into the package, right? The C64 card or the Atari 400 card. And they could just have a system that has a big disk drive with a, you know, hundreds of games on it. And every time they say print, or, you know, press a copy, it does the appropriate accounting. There were companies that, that tried to set that up. There was at least one. I think there was even more than one who came out with that as a pitch. And it was like, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. It would save us a lot of inventory risk. And as long as, you know, there wasn't, you know, piracy, um, you know, this could work. But it, it never got off the ground. And I'm not sure I know why. Hmm. Nintendo actually had something like that in Japan with their Famicom disk system. Where you would have a disc, um, a magnetic disc. It wasn't a three and a half inch. It was a proprietary size. And there were kiosks in stores and convenience stores where you would just pop in the disc. You could choose a game. You'd pay for it over a credit card or whatever. And then you'd have a new game on your disc and take it home and play it. Um, and they unfortunately ran into the problem of massive piracy. Uh, now it was. That there was a fear of that, which is was stopping folks from being willing to sign up for it. And if they didn't have a bunch of game companies, you know, supporting it, it was never going to fly, right? So, hmm. one of one of these, you know, you had to have both ends. You had to have the supply and the demand, right? So, yeah. Um, and what did I see? Did I not see coming at all that took me completely by surprise? So many things, right? <laughs> oh, jeez. I mean, the business model of the industry has changed so many times since I got involved. Well, okay, here's a big one. I thought the whole idea of free to play was a uh, was nuts. Like, <laughs> why would they ever pay if it's free? And you know, like, so I was like, Zingo was starting. I, you know, I could have bought shares. I thought I thought it was crazy. Um, my sister was playing Farmville and she, she was nuts over it, you know, and she's, you know, she's a professional, she's got a good job, she's got kids, she's got a family, and yet she jump up at dinner and say, oh my God, I got to go pick my carrots. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. And at some point I said to her, well, so how much have you spent on playing these games? And she said, Nothing. Like, it would be insulting to think that she would pay a dime to play these games. And I was like, yeah, that's what I assume most people would be like. But little did I know, I mean, yeah, you can have 97% of customers behave that way. But the 3% who are paying, some of them are paying insane amounts of money. So I'm yeah. on the board of this, you know, formerly Disruptor Beam, now named, you know, changed the name as they got out of mobile gaming. They're now... Uh, just selling their engine, uh, be, it's now called Beamable. But, you know, they were running the, uh, um, uh, Game of Thrones mobile game, and then they did Star ah. Trek, and then they did Walking Dead. And, um, they had, you know, on Star Trek, or even Game of Thrones too, I mean, they had multiple people who had spent over $50,000. What? And, I am serious. And there are, there are games in that space where there are many, many people who have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the whole business model becomes how do you attract, they call them the whales, just the way casinos do, right? The yeah. big spenders are what make these games. And you design the game to suck them in. And then you keep adding things to keep them keep shelling out money. And so it just a completely different mindset. I, I kind of it kind of disgusts me at some level the the, the, <laughs> you know, the business, but obviously it works. And you know there are companies that have made insane amounts of money. I mean Fortnite was doing what three billion dollars a year as a free to play game. It's insane. It's insane. Premium. 
Yeah. So see that I'm still kind of surprised by it, <laughs> and it's the primary business model now. Yeah, it's and there's no end to it in sight apparently. Although we've said that many times in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, selling software in a box in a store is, you know, kind of ancient history. Though. Yeah, that's true. It's true. As a collector, it's uh, it, it's a little sad to not see it anymore. And then you look at uh, the, uh, the old box games on the shelf and you're just like, ah, oh, yesteryear. But well, you know, I've got hundreds of Kindle books now, too, and I've got probably a thousand real books, but very often, I, you know, I'll discover an author and I like them and, you know, there are very few bookstores these days. Mm. So you can't, and, you know, rather than order the book online and wait for it to arrive, I can instantaneously have it on my Kindle. So I tend, if I can't easily buy a, a book in a bookstore, I often end up buying them on Kindle. And so I've got hundreds of Kindle books now, but they're just not the same. You know, no. not, um, and there is no physical presence there. And I like the, I like holding a book. I like the sense that you can instantaneously tell that you're eighty percent done with it. You know, <laughs> there are things about a real book that I miss when I'm on the symbol. That's true. That's true, Mike. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. It really has been an amazing journey. This conversation, and I, yeah. Do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners? <laughs> I'm wondering how you're going to edit all, all this. <laughs> <laughs> many, many long nights and several beers. Oh. Well, what are my parting thoughts for your listeners? Persistence. I think probably the thing that's been my the, the greatest reason for the success I've had was just keep at it. Don't give up. That's actually really good advice. Very good advice. Now, there are probably times when it's crazy to keep at it. <laughs> but I generally kept that things. I mean, I stayed at Infocom till the very end, right? So. True, true. But it didn't hurt ultimately too much. Not too much. Hmm. I often wonder, though, like what would have happened if, you know, much earlier on, I'd moved out to the West Coast and done the kind of job hopping that typically happens in the industry. And who knows? But then again, without the without the job hopping, you you mature a little bit more. You you see more of it, I guess, um, at one company. Yeah, taking a company for thirteen years from fifteen employees to over three hundred. You know, yeah, you see things. That you probably would never see job happen. Yeah. 